Okay, a couple of things before I start. Um, first of all, the, talk, the work I'm going to talk to you about tonight is not only my own work. This is a collaborative project that I run with NOAA scientists in Seattle at the NOAA Science Center. Okay, I'm in the wrong position. How's that? Uh, I also work closely with Joel Baker at the University of Washington Tacoma uh, at the Urban Water Center right across the water here. And for those of you who don't know where I work, Puyallup is the next town over. And I can get to the Harmon in 10 minutes from where I work. And I do that very frequently. <laughs> and Joel and I spend a lot of time in here. So it's great to be here to, to give you a, a talk tonight. The other thing I wanted to tell you is this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on pesticides tonight, but I want you to think about this in a bit of, of a different way. We know that organisms, especially in aquatic environments, are exposed to what I like to call pollutant soup. In other words, a whole range of chemicals, usually at very low concentrations, but many chemicals, not just pesticides. And so I'm going to talk about pesticides tonight, but I want you to consider or realize that they're exposed, these animals are exposed to all types of different chemicals, metals, industrial chemicals, combustion products, pesticides, fertilizers, all kinds of other chemicals as well as mixtures. And that makes things very complicated. And in fact, at our lab, what we do is very untraditional in the toxicological area, and that is as we focus on mixtures of chemicals, exposing fish and aquatic invertebrates to these soups at concentrations that are found in the environment. And that's very different than what most toxicologists do. They usually look at one chemical at a time, okay? What I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a bit about benefits and risks of pesticides. And there are benefits to pesticides, otherwise we wouldn't use them. I'll talk to you a little bit about the effects of pesticides on ecosystems, how they get into water, and then go over a couple of quick case studies of some of our findings. First of all, the chemical uh, pesticide industry is a $32 billion a year industry worldwide. That's a big industry. And the U.S. accounts for about a third of that. I mentioned benefits of pesticides. First of all, we control crop pests, insects, disease, weeds. And because of that, food is cheaper. It's available all year round. We also control disease-transmitting organisms. And this is one of the most important uses of pesticides. If you think about malaria, for example, in our tropical regions of the world, if we didn't control mosquitoes, many, many more people would die. We control pests of veterinary importance, and for those of us who have animals, this is very important to keep your animals healthy. Uh, we control household and structural pests, like termites, and, and around here, carpenter ants. And because we use pesticides, and this is something that a lot of people don't consider, we, ha we use less land to produce food than if we didn't use them. So in other words, a lot of our wild lands and preserves would have to be converted into ag lands to feed our population if we didn't use them. The reason I bring all this up is, is many people think pesticides are bad, bad, bad all the time, but they do have, have benefits and, and great uses, and I want you to think about that. Now, obviously, the risks of pesticides are, the ones we're going to focus on tonight are, are environmental risks, but we also have human health risks, such as cancers and other, other diseases that can happen after exposures, and then damage to sensitive non-target organisms, which is what we're going to focus on tonight. The other thing I want you to think about is this. When organisms are exposed to chemicals, a couple of things can happen. One is what we consider or call direct effects. And what this means is that the animal is exposed to the chemical and some kind of damage occurs. For example, an extreme case would be a fish kill that I pictured here. Okay? But you can also have sublethal effects where organisms are exposed to a pesticide or some chemical and they're impaired in some way. They don't produce as many offspring, for example. Another, another classic is when uh, males turn into females as they develop, or females become sterilized, or you have cancers that occur, or reductions in lifespan, behavioral changes. So many things can happen when organisms are exposed to pollution, not just death. Then another thing can happen, and that is an indirect effect, which is an effect on the food web or the food chain of an organism. So in other words, you may have a chemical that has no direct effect on a salmon, but it may take out their food supply. It may kill the aquatic insects and other aquatic invertebrates that young salmon need to survive. And that happens quite often as well. And in fact, what we find is that certain invertebrates are actually much more sensitive to certain chemicals than the fish themselves, 
but it still has a damaging effect on salmon. So we'll talk about what's in our water and how does it get there. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, we have a soup out there of pollutants. And they come, they get into the water in many ways, or several major ways. And the first is, if we're talking about pesticides, drift. Every time someone applies pesticides, if there's wind or sufficient wind around, they're gonna, it's going to pick up aerosols of this chemical and move it off site. Okay? And if it lands even on a road, how do you think it could get in water from a road? It rains around here just a little bit, right? And storm water can move pesticides uh, off of a road or off of your lawn for that matter. So pesticides can move as aerosols in the air off site. The other thing that occurs is what we call volatilization, where a solid or a liquid turns into a gas, and then that material will move around through the atmosphere. And this is how pesticides end up in the Arctic. Have any, uh, you've probably heard that sometimes we find things like DDT in the ice caps on our planet, and other pesticides and other chemicals. Well, they get there by moving through the atmosphere as a gas. Then we have runoff. Higher? Okay, sorry. Runoff is, is a big problem around here, and what, what this means is that, again, as I mentioned, we have a big rain event, and say you just put out a weed and feed on your lawn, a lot of that might be washed off uh, and go into a storm drain and then right into a, a stream or a river. And then we have leaching, and when this, what, what happens here is a chemical is applied, say, to a lawn, and it just uh, percolates down through sandy soils and ends up in groundwater aquifers. And the problem there is, is that we use uh, a lot of our groundwater for drinking water. In fact, 60% of the United States uses groundwater for drinking water. And then also, groundwater aquifers usually open up into a river or a stream somewhere. And so you can move chemicals like pesticides through leaching. Okay. I'm going to tilt this back. Now, the thing to consider is this. With pesticides in particular, they're seasonal, right? We don't usually put pesticides on our lawns in the middle of the winter, right? So they're going to appear in rivers and streams at certain times of the year, and the concentrations over the year are going to fluctuate. And they pulse through systems. So what this means is that you'll get, everyone goes out in May, for example, and puts down a weed and feed. There's some rain, and you get a big pulse of pesticides that'll go through a river or a stream and then they, di they dilute very quickly and they break down and they're gone, okay? Now, again, like I say, so that's important because depending, you know, depends on what kind of organisms are actually present when that happens, and those are the ones that'll be affected. So, but background levels are always present for many pesticides because what happens is a lot of them go into sediment and then they go back and forth into the water column and back into the sediment um, as a process uh, that occurs, and that can result in them being around for quite some time. Now, there was a seminal study that was done in the late 90s and early 2000s by the U.S. Geological Survey called the NAQUA study. And what these scientists did was is they went all around the United States and took water samples, both groundwater and surface water samples, everywhere they could. And they were looking for pesticides to get a feel for what was really in our nation's waters. And what they found was that pesticides were present basically everywhere they looked, and they were there in mixtures, but the concentrations were very low. Certain pesticides were found more commonly in urban and suburban areas than in agricultural areas. And in particular, what they found was that a lot of insecticides and, and homeowner use herbicides were found in waters that drain urban and suburban areas. And if you see this situation here, which is not unlike what we have, for example, in Ording. All right, does anyone know where Ording is and been in the Ording Valley? Okay, maybe you live in Ording. Um, a lot of houses, and the Puyallup River is, is near there. And if everybody in there, everybody here goes out and applies pesticides, and then we have rain, guess what happens, all right? So that was a very interesting finding, and it was what started us working on mixture effects because of this NACWA study, because they were finding these, these common mixtures of homeowner use products. I worked with King County around this time because they were part of the NACWA survey, and these were the 
pesticides that were found in King County rivers and streams uh, during this, this survey. So that's a lot of, lot of different pesticides. And one of the interesting things about this is, is you'll see that DDT is up there. And what's interesting about that is, is that DDT, when it's released in the environment, converts to another chemical called DDE fairly rapidly. And DDE is also an insecticide, and it's, it's toxic. If you find actual DDT, like, like was found here, it means people are still using DDT. And so you might wonder how that's possible since it was banned in the 70s. Well, people have it still, and it's got a half-life of 30 years. And so it's still available, and you can still use it if you have I mean, you can't legally use it, but if you have it, it's still going to work. All right? So that was an interesting finding, but a lot of chemicals were found in our waters in Washington State. Now, we have five major species of salmon in the Northwest, which are coho, chinooks, sockeye, pink, chum, and then steelhead, um, if you consider steelhead salmon. A steelhead is just a rainbow trout that goes out to the ocean in part of its life cycle. You also know that salmon do spend part of their life in fresh water, go out to the ocean, and then come back to spawn. And the focus of our work up to this point has been on the young salmon in, in rivers and streams. And what we know is this, wild salmon populations are in, are in decline in many areas. And there, this is usually attributed to the four H's, habitat loss, hydropower, harvest, and hatcheries. But also now we're finding that pollution plays a major role as well. Some populations of our wild, our wild salmon have declined 95% since the 1940s. And if you talk to some of the older people from this area, they tell you some amazing things. Like back in the 1930s, you could walk across the Puyallup River on the backs of salmon. Well, I can tell you this, you don't see that anymore. They're gone. I mean, the populations are very low. They're not gone, but they have definitely declined. Okay, so my colleague, Nat Scholes from, from NOAA, did a study back in 2000 where they looked at a very common homeowner insecticide, diazinon, and its effects on Chinook salmon, young Chinook salmon. And what they found was that exposure to this commonly found insecticide in our rivers and streams damaged the ability of the fish to smell. And you, say, you may say, well, why, does that, why is that important? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is that salmon need to be able to smell to find food, they need to be able to smell to avoid predators, and they need to be able to home back to breeding grounds. And this insecticide caused permanent brain damage at very low concentrations, as low as one part per billion and up to 10 parts per billion for the different effects they found. But this was only one chemical. We followed this study up and published this, uh, this study uh, in 2009 on the synergistic effects of pesticides on salmon, where we looked at five common insecticides and at low concentrations and various mixtures of these things. But we only looked at pairs. We didn't look at all of them together. And what we found is something called synergism. And what synergism is is that the effect is much greater than expected. So for example, if you had one part per billion of one chemical, say diazinon, and one part per billion of malathion, and they're in the same class of compounds, you would think that then the exposure of the two of them together would be equal to two parts per billion of either one alone. But what we found is, is that it was more like 100, okay? So that there was some kind of an interaction between these two chemicals that made them much more poisonous in combination than alone. And that's something that was very unexpected, and it has actually led to the banning of, uh, of these products or, or the reductions in their use. Not total ban in some cases, but in others they have been. So this is a very surprising finding, and we've been following that up with other studies now. But the thing is, is these are old technologies. This, these are called the organophosphates and carbamates. They're very common insecticides, again, like diazinon and malathion. And there are whole new classes of pesticides now that chemical companies have produced that they claim are much safer for the environment. So of course, as scientists, we want to know, is that true? And we start evaluating all of these products. And one of these is called spinosad, which is a natural product, and it's approved for organic farming, okay? It comes from a soil uh, organism, and it's a fermentation product, a soil bacterium, and it's a neurotoxin. 
And whoops, let me back up on that. And we looked at the effects of this, of this particular uh, chemical on salmon and on the invertebrates that they feed upon. And what we found was that salmon really weren't affected by this product, but that the invertebrates that they feed upon were very, very sensitive to this product. And that's now since been verified in field studies in France, and, and there are other studies as well that show that basically what, what this chemical can do is knock out part of the food chain, and that has a detrimental effect on the salmon. But if you only looked at the salmon themselves, they were virtually unaffected by exposure to this chemical. The other, another common insecticide, and in fact it's the most commonly used insecticide in the world today, is called imidacloprid. Now, how, don't you like these names? I wonder who invents chemical names, right? Imidacloprid. Well, anyway, this one acts like nicotine. And it's designed in such a way that if you have a liver, you'll break it down quickly and it won't have a negative effect on you. But if you're an invertebrate and you don't have a liver, there's a problem. And that's, it's an insecticide and it's designed that way to kill insects but not hurt mammals in particular. So we also looked at this product and uh, its effects on salmon and on invertebrates and found pretty much the same thing that we did with spinosad. It wasn't terribly toxic to salmon directly, but it was really toxic on, the f on their food, okay? And this, again, as I say, is the most commonly used product that there is today. We're now evaluating a whole series of new chemicals, and we're starting to look at mixtures of them. And uh, I'll have to tell you in a future talk about what we find on that. So anyway, with that, I've got a couple of pictures for you. This, these are Daphnia. Uh, they're, they're small crustaceans that, that are, are very common in all freshwater systems. We do a lot of work on these and they're food for young salmon. And I'll leave you with this picture uh, because there are real benefits to having healthy salmon populations in our state. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. So, so the question is um, a problem with hatchery fish. This is actually a very contentious issue but um, my experience with raising animals in labs indicates to me that hatchery fish are not the same as wild fish. Because what happens is, is when you raise animals in a hatchery, you're basically selecting for genetic traits that make those animals do well in captivity. The other argument to that is, is though that they do go out to the ocean and if they come back alive to spawn, then they're pretty successful. But they are different and they can be supplanting the wild fish and there's a loss or there could be a loss of genetic diversity. So that's, that's the, real, the real issue. Okay. I've seen in our neighborhood and other places that they have looks sort of like a black cloth that they put on the, the like the street water drains, and it has a thing that says that it's for protecting the fish. Do you know how long those last, or does that really help? To tell you, to tell you the truth, I'm not familiar with that. It's, it's a piece of black cloth that's put over a, strong, a storm drain? Yeah, on the, on the storm drains, it actually, um, they put it sort of underneath, but it hangs out the edges, and yeah. it's supposed to catch like the oil and stuff. I mm -hmm. didn't know if it also mm -hmm. would filter out. Yeah, it's a filtration pesticide. system. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't know much about it, oh, okay. um, so I'm not sure how long it would last. Okay. Are there any, are there any educational programs that you know of in this area that are targeted specifically to gardeners so that those who are, are concerned about the toxicity from home, ho home horticulture chemicals uh, could do something about it? That's, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because WSU's Master Gardener program does exactly that. And they have great educational programs about the use of pesticides and home gardens and a uh, very valuable program. And it is actually located at the WSU Puyallup Research and Extension Center where I work. Hello, John. Yeah, I had a question about uh, ocean acidification, and that's more on the emission side. And is, are you doing any studies of the emissions in Puget Sound on the fish, too? 
o ocean acidification has to do with carbon dioxide uh, in, the, in the oceans and, and changing the pH uh, to acetic, which has effects on, uh, on shellfish, for example, and, and, and shell-forming organisms and other organisms. But so that, that part, I am not working on that. There are other scientists in the region that work on that area. So when you talk about emissions, are you talking about CO2 or are you talking about other compounds? But yeah, uh, car emissions, diesel emissions right. that you know end up right. in a toxic soup in the Puget Sound ultimately. Yes. We, um, at our center, um, we have uh, recently opened a low impact development stormwater center and working with uh, Urban Waters and our colleagues at NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we're looking at um, emissions, you know, uh, breakdown products from automobile emissions, for example, as well as metals that come off of brake pads and tires and oil and grease and things like that, and their effects on aquatic organisms and the ability of what we call low impact development, which are basically pervious pavements and rain gardens to clean those pollutants from water before they enter uh, streams and rivers and the Puget Sound. So we are on, right on the verge of starting up a big research program in that area. And in fact, our first project was funded by the Russell Family Foundation, which is a local foundation in Tacoma. Do we have any more questions? I, I had a question about the, um, you're talking about uh, I guess herbicide, uh, and if that can count. Um, wondering about something like a Roundup. Uh, you know, I guess I sort of feel like, yeah, that's okay. That's just taking care of, of, of weeds or whatever I specifically hit, but and, and feel like it's okay because fish and whatever don't photosynthesize. Do you have any thoughts on on uh, how that affects the uh, the rest of the chain? Okay. Um, yeah, the question is about herbicides and Roundup in particular and their p potential effects on other organisms. Herbicides are obviously designed to kill plants. And so the, the prevailing wisdom has always been, well, they won't have effects on animal life or other, you know, other organisms. And that's not true. What we're finding is, is that for, for certain herbicides and certain organisms, there are negative effects associated with exposures. Roundup is one of the safest herbicides you can use. However, there are some studies, and they're somewhat controversial, that show that they do have negative effects on wildlife and even on human health. What we're finding is we're doing, as was mentioned earlier, working on endangered butterflies in California, and they're using herbicides to clear weeds out of refuge areas. And we've found, uh, when they started using these herbicides, they found that the butterfly populations actually declined more rapidly than b before they were used. And we've now done studies and found that every herbicide we've looked at so far has had a negative effect on butterflies, their ability to reach the adult stage. So if they're exposed as larvae, a lot of them just don't make it to the adult stage. So another thing is um, you may know about amphibian decline, right? Amphibian decline is a really big issue in the world. And there have been a number of studies that show that, for example, certain herbicides um, actually act uh, on the um, hormone systems in a very negative way in amphibians. So herbicides can, although they're designed to kill plants, have negative effects on, on animal life. And so mm -hmm. if you're using that on your lawn, it you know, can still be a problem. Uh, these storm sewers, like right out here by uh, entering into into the main bay here, there, it's about six or eight foot tall. How do you control what goes down through that area? Yeah. There are, there are technologies that are developed or being developed as stormwater uh, systems that you put into storm drains that filter. One of them was mentioned here before, but I, that's one I'm not familiar with. So there are companies that are making products that can be inserted into storm drains and actually filter water. But the other way to handle that is, is to put in some pervious pavements and some other systems that c catch the water before it gets to a storm drain and filter it and reduce the flow. So it's difficult, though. Yes, it is. There is uh, a lot of organic farming going on these days, particularly in the Northwest. 
Do we have any measure of what the effect of organic farming has had on fish, fish fisheries? I'm not familiar with a study on fisheries and organic farming and the effects of that on, on fish, no. I've, I've seen some studies on health effects in humans that, that consume organic diets versus non-organic and showing very beneficial, you know, good health benefits uh, to the organic diet. But I haven't seen anything on, on fish uh, related to that. Any more questions? I just had a question for you. What about using, you know, I, I've used rock salt before. I, is that okay for killing weeds or would you? It's, it's pretty, pretty good. I mean, I think it's probably safer than uh, some of the other uh, chemicals you might use. Yeah. Do you have any like solutions or ideas on how we could change this process or like what to do to revert these effects of the pesticides in the waters on the salmon? Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, we, we're, we've uh, developed this big low impact development center uh, at WSU Puyallup and we're looking at the ability of these systems to clean storm water, okay? And so if we if, these, if we prove that these systems work the way we think they do, and there's some, some evidence to that effect so far, um, what it would entail would be putting more of these systems in place to uh, filter stormwater. That's one way. And as I mentioned, you know, chemicals can get into water in uh, several different ways, but the runoff part can be addressed to some degree. Um, but the other solution is to use pesticides wisely, always follow the label, um, and, and try to use the safest products and studies that we do, you know, end up having chemicals banned, that's helpful as well. This thing about the label is very important. I want to tell you just a quick s story. I do a lot of surveys around the area and talk to homeowners, and quite often I'll find that someone has a really nice lawn, and I'll go up and ask them how they do that, and they'll say, well, I'll show you, and they, they'll pull out a bag of, of fertilizer that has uh, pesticides in it as well, and they'll say, well, you know, I put this down six times during the, the summer. And I'll look at the label and it'll say, apply once or twice a year. And so I say to them, well, you know, it says, put this only down, you know, once or twice a year. And they say, oh, well, you know. And, and I say, well, how much are you putting down? And they'll say, well, whatever it says in the label, I triple it. Okay? Those kinds of misuses, you know, really cause a problem. That, that's putting a lot of chemical in the environment. And when you multiply that by many homeowners, uh, it, it can be a big issue. The other thing a lot of people don't understand is that a pesticide label is a law. It's actually a law, and if you don't follow it exactly, you're breaking the law. Now, there isn't going to be someone more than likely that comes out and arrests you for doing that, but it is a law, okay? John, thanks for giving us this talk. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm curious about the um, change over time. Have you actually tracked uh, like a time series uh, of pesticides and their growth? Um, there has been some recent work done by the uh, State Department of Agriculture showing that the pesticides that I mentioned, the ones we've been studying, have declined tremendously in our waters since these labeling changes have been made. The restrictions in, label in the use and the banning of some of these products there, some of them are not found at all in, in a lot of our salmon bearing streams now, but there are other products that are there, some of the newer ones that I mentioned, for example. So there are changes that are occurring, but one of the other problems is the more people that we have moving into our area means more pesticides. You know, we build more homes, um, you know, and you get, get more people using these products. But Anyway, some of the ones we've worked on have declined greatly, but that's due to laws that were enacted by EPA. Wendy. Have, have you yourself conducted any studies, or do you know of any that are ongoing, um, as to how these pesticides affect the organisms in the intertidal in Puget Sound? I, I have not. I've not worked in that area, um, and I'm not really familiar with some, anyone that's doing that at least right now. Um, it's, it's a, that's a complex system for one thing, but again, I'm not familiar with anyone doing it in this region right now. Do 
So I was interested in, um, so a lot of your results seemed like they were experimental laboratory results. And if you have um, sort of observational, um, uh, observations that correspond to sort of effects on sensitive invertebrates that are, have food, whip, food web effects and salmon are really suffering. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And, and we do. We do, uh, we do a lot of lab studies and we also do field studies where we go out and characterize streams, rivers, um, and more recently, my colleagues from NOAA, Nat Scholes and his group, are looking at pre-spawn mortality in King County, and they're finding that adult salmon that come back to spawn, somewhere between 20 and 90 percent, depending on what river or stream they're in, are dying before they spawn, and they're exhibiting behaviors that are indicative of exposure to pollutant mixtures. So we do back, back a lot of this up in the field, and not only do we do that, but as I mentioned earlier, a study in France on spinosad, and there are other studies around the world that are, that are doing uh, elaborate field studies. The problem with field studies is they're very expensive, and they're not easily replicated, you know, because there are, you can't, and you can't control the environment and other things, so, but there are some really good ones that back uh, up what we're saying. Do we have any more questions? All right. How healthy is the Puyallup River compared to other rivers in the Puget Sound area? <laughs> Boy, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough question. Without, you know, the, the, there's so many data points you'd have to look at for a comparison that it's difficult to say. But there are problems on the Puyallup that it, where uh, certain measures are being, tolerances are being exceeded for various factors. And there are some real problems with that river system. But then again, the Green River, the Duwamish, huge problems there. In fact, I would say in most of your, your rivers and streams in urbanized areas in western Washington, we've got real problems. But to pick on the Puyallup alone, I, 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 it, it's tough to say. It's complicated. So what is the, the best like low impact development that you've used for removing pesticides from stormwater? Okay. The low, low impact development is a series of techniques. It's not one, it's like there are green roofs, there are pervious asphalt uh, systems, pervious concrete, different types of rain gardens. And the problem is, is that there, there isn't a very large data set on what these systems remove. A lot of it was done with copper and zinc, okay? And there have been, been fewer studies with other chemicals. And the pesticides have not really been examined very well. There's almost nothing out there on pesticides. And nutrients. Another big problem we have is, is nutrients like phosphorus and nitrate, okay? So those are the kinds of things we're going to look at in our studies that are on, ongoing, that are, are, are coming up uh, very soon. But again, there just isn't a lot of information on it. Uh, could you so, um, describe the process that it takes to, for a pesticide to go from like the research phase to come to market, what the testing requirements are? It seems like you're finding out some of the yeah. facts after it's already out. That's, a, that, that's actually a great question. If you're a pesticide company and you develop a new product, what you usually do is you screen a lot of different compounds. And you usually start with a model of, of a compound that's often found in nature, okay? So it could be from some marine organism, or in the case of spinosad, it's a, it's a bacterium, and they found this, this chemical that this bacterium releases. And then they take that, and they usually modify the compound in a lot of different ways and find out, they tweak it chemically and find out, you know, what's the most toxic one to insects, and does it have anti-cancer properties? They, look, they screen it for pharmaceutical as well as, as pesticidal properties. Then once they, they have a winner or something that really looks good, they have to go through a huge process to uh, develop data for EPA for registration. And it, it involves exposing a whole series of organisms uh, and in various types of studies uh, to produce this large data set. The problem is, is that it's very heavy and very intensive on, on mammals, rats, for example. All right, and less so on other organisms. 
And when you get down to the invertebrates, it's, it's very lightweight, let's say. Where they, for example, insects are, uh, they constitute the biggest group of organisms or animal life on the planet, okay? Companies in the U.S. for registration only have to expose one insect species to their pesticides for their studies, and that's the honeybee. And it's only an acute mortality study. In other words, they expose the bees and see at what concentration they die. They don't look at sublethal effects or long-term effects. It's just an acute exposure, very short-term, and that's it. And so the problem, again, is, is there's a range of data that they have to produce, and, and it really leans heavily towards mammalian because they want to protect humans. And, so, and that's the way it's structured, so the environmental end of it is a little bit weak. 